Hey, what's happening gamers? Welcome to another Retro Monday, where the goal of this show is to turn your Monday into a fun day. Let me just uh, clear the air up. This video is not the awesome X-Men 2 Clone Wars. It's just the X-Men, or X-Men. I have fond memories of this game, believe it or not, but it was mainly from a spectator's point of view, as Luke Knights was playing this game and I just got to watch him play it. But I wanted to continue X-Men month with this decent game because I remember it and know a lot about it. X-Men was developed by Western Technologies Incorporated and released in 1993 for the Sega Genesis and Sega Mega Drive. Rather than being based after the actual TV show, this game is geared more toward the Marvel Comics property. It also combines the rosters from X-Men's Blue and Gold teams respectively. Most of the game takes place in the Danger Room and has the X-Men fighting for their very lives in a battle of survival. See, Eric has sent a nasty virus to the Danger Room computers and removed all the safety limits. So this is really no game for our heroes, true believers. Sorry, Stanley thing. Just so you know, this game can be played solo or with a friend, but because of this game's ruthless difficulty, there's no way I could bribe my wife to play it with me. Anyway, players are able to choose between four of the X-Men. They are Nightcrawler, Gambit, Wolverine, and Cyclops. This game combines side-scrolling action with platforming, and lots and lots of platforming. Actually, way too much for my taste. The X-Men actually fight their way through a series of Danger Room scenarios and then head to Asteroid M and fight the final boss. In terms of the game, play, well, each character can punch, jump, and use superpowers too. Keeping track of the mutant's powers is done with that blue bar underneath the health bar. Depending on how much power you use, the faster it will drain, but that's just common sense. Don't worry though, it does refill over time. During the course of the game, you can call in five X-Men to assist you, although Jean Grey helps you back up automatically once you fall. The other four are selected in the pause menu, then you just activate your mutant power to use them. So what didn't I like about this game? Well, a few things come to mind, actually. For starters, Cyclops is definitely the worst character in this game. All of the other characters, except for Nightcrawler's standing attack, are pretty well balanced in this game and very well done. But Summers is a big epic failure. His standard attacks are the weakest in the game, and playing this game on hero or superhero results in his death very quickly. Don't get me wrong, his mutant power is one of the most powerful in the game, and I liked being able to aim his optic blast in different directions. Even so, once his power is gone, this guy's like a sitting duck, and not to mention he takes forever to take down just one bad guy. My next point, X-Men, is feared by many gamers my age for being crazy difficult. The game will beat your face in so bad time and time again. The fact that it sorely lacks many health power-ups doesn't help its case either. The levels that I hated the most in terms of difficulty had to be Mojo's World and of course Asteroid M. Asteroid M has to be one of the worst levels in the game because of the guards. They shoot you and your character's frozen until they die. Just so you know, I despise those unkempt dudes to no end. Still, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this complaint because it relates to my third dislike the platforming. Jumping is an absolute joke in this game, and characters have such a hard time jumping onto ledges. I mean, it's so bad. Look at here. Gambit can't even get out of this one spot, and the ledge isn't even that high. If his jump was just a little bit higher, then he'd get up there no problem. Instead, I gotta switch to Nightcrawler just so I can phase through there. That's pathetic. Not to mention your characters can accidentally fall through ledges and just overshoot them, slip right off, and it makes the game a lot harder than it really needs to be, and that's a dire shame. The fact that Marvel Girl is actually there to save your bacon during most of the game is actually a double-edged sword, because every time you fall, your health still depletes a lot. And eventually, even if you fall and she brings you back up, you're still going to die. I just don't get how this game made it past the beta. I really don't. But that's beside the point. The final thing that ruins this game is actually something that really could have been cool. Before entering Mojo's world, Professor X tells you that you need to reset the computer manually. 
So what the game is telling you is you actually need to reset your actual Genesis, so it's breaking the fourth wall. Now I have to say, this was a very cool element, but the only problem with restarting the system is it doesn't always work right, and you'll lose your game progress and need to start the game all over again. And trust me, this is not one of those games that's fun to play through again and again. Let me tell you, this led to a lot of nerd rage growing up, and there's a lot of reasons why many gamers haven't finished this game because they just can't get this to work properly. Alrighty, calm down folks, I don't hate this game. Is it broken? Oh yeah! But it does have some redeeming qualities too. Personally, graphics for this game aren't really that great for a Genesis game. They really aren't, especially for 1993. The sprites look okay, and they're modeled after, of course, Jim Lee's artwork, but most of the environments are all the same up until you get inside the lighthouse, and that's where it gets a little bit different. As a kid, I can just remember my friend going down and getting the glasses so you can see those different tech ghosts, which in reality are actually clones of your X-Men. I thought this was really a cool concept at the time, and I liked how the whole level has this greenish tint to it. It really makes the player feel like they're putting on the glasses so they can see the enemy. That was a really awesome thing, but it wasn't used that much in the game, it's just this one level. However, on the music front, I have to say the game is very well done and sounds great. To me, the grungy, rock, electronic sounding beats tribute the actual cartoon show from Fox Kids, and I like that. The score was composed by Fletcher Beasley using the gem system for the Sega Genesis, which if some of you are wondering, that's the actual emulation music system for the Genesis and Mega Drive. Aside from the Terra Bad platforming, system. The gameplay was pretty decent. I don't know about you guys, but I loved the throwback to the first Turtles NES game, but was kind of bummed that I couldn't switch between the X-Men as many times as I needed to. This made me have to adjust my strategy per level a little bit more than I wanted to. Still, I have to say it was a great addition. Even though it was limited to switching two or three times a level, it was still a great asset. Assist characters were also a huge addition to this game, and I'm a little annoyed that the critics downplayed this feature, because let me tell you, this was a godsend for certain parts of the game. While not all the X-Men are really useful for fighting bosses, each non-playable hero has a purpose. Take uh, Iceman, for instance. He can aid you by getting past annoying obstacles by creating an ice bridge. Storm can wipe out a whole screen of baddies, Rogue can open doors or defeat just one bad guy that's getting in your way, and Gene picks you up when you fall to your death. But the best assist character has to be Archangel, because he brings some serious destruction to pretty much all the bosses in the game. Although these heroes can only be used once per level, players can collect their icons again to use them later if they need to. In terms of the playable X-Men, the best characters to play as has to be Logan and Kurt. But in all honesty, this game is best played with Nightcrawler because he balances out the insane difficulty of this game and his mutant power can help you skip different parts of the level. So it's perfect for speedrunners. Think of his teleport abilities kind of like a debug glitch or breaking the game, so to speak, but in a good way so it doesn't crash your system. I really, really love it when developers do their homework and spend time researching the comic book games. And they got all the X-Men and their villains' mutant powers correct. And I dig that. Wolverine can heal back from the brink of death. Even though it's wicked slower than your mutant bar, he can still heal, which is awesome. Getting back to the star of this game, though, which we all know is Nightcrawler. What isn't to love about this character? I mean, seriously. His jump attack is the best in the game. You can teleport through walls, use your ability to easily defeat all the bosses in this game. Even Apocalypse and Magneto are no match for Nightcrawler's mutant ability. And I'll let you in on a little secret too. If you tap his mutant power, it doesn't use any energy as long as you don't move him from that spot. This ability evens the playing field and then some for this game. And once you learn how to use Nightcrawler effectively, you won't want to play as anybody else, I guarantee it. I know what you guys and gals are thinking. Does this game have any lasting appeal though? You bet it does. It also has some complex codes too, like the famous level select. Though I was never very good at this, and uh, also there's also a life code and extending the downtime in between the danger room to collect the floating health. Which, the floating health is the only way that you can recover health after the levels. Unlike many other console games in the 1990s, Sega was your one stop between the danger room to your X-Men needs, including having you covered at home and on the go. While we won't be spending this series showing all of them, I will be doing X-Men 2 Clone Wars, which is the direct sequel to this game and came out in 1995. 
It is also revered by many fans as one of the best X-Men games ever created. In closing though, this game is pretty good, and back in the day it received scores of 7s and 8s. While I think an 8 for this game is a bit too high because of some of the bugs we mentioned, and of course the infamous Gambit debug where he can skip pretty much any level. This game definitely paved the way for better X-Men games, and of course we saw this with Mutant Apocalypse on the Super Nintendo. It was also a breath of fresh air from the onslaught of bad X-Men games done by LGN and others. While I can agree this game can be pretty evil and downright frustrating, it can also be very rewarding and a lot of fun to play. So I'm going to suggest that if you can find this game, buy it. Well, thus wraps up another Retro Monday. Join me next time as my good friend the Peanut Butter Gamer swings by as we take on one of my favorite arcade games of all time, X-Men. Yes, that X-Men. Widely considered the best X-Men game in existence. So if you want to check out his channel in the meantime to get super hyped up for this video, then be my guest. That's all. Remember I have a Facebook, Twitter, and also a game albums on iTunes, too, if you're interested. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch another episode, and until we meet again, gamers, God bless, and happy gaming.